got my, I wore my suit, my own, I almost won the Super Bowl ring to the conferences the last week and haven't put it back in my safe. That's so I still got my. Let's see it. I didn't see it. Oh, I don't have it. I have it downstairs. I got it. That was just the case they gave. I think the case was worth $400 itself or something crazy. That's funny. That almost won the Super Bowl. Do you guys, did you go to the Super Bowl that year? Yeah. That's why you almost won it. That means you lost. Yeah, fair. I haven't won the Super Bowl in, in quite a minute. Yeah, loser. I guess it's better than not going at all, though. Antoine Williams, I see you in that weight room. Look at him, still working. That's the that's the life of a private sector coach. Right there, man. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Been here since five o'clock this morning. <laughs> you want to get started? Yeah, go for it. I figured, you know, what I wrote in the post and stuff is maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes on just how you use the tier system, categorize and make base training programs and then uh we'll see where it goes and then do some q a at the end yeah i think the biggest thing is uh a lot of a lot of this was spurred by steve so give steve all the credit for putting this together and as well as uh working for well over a year with his team to put together a lot of my information into his app and this is what uh this is part of the whole process with the building an app and bringing recognition to Steve and his team and tell and I'll let Steve do about five minutes before the Q and a, just to fill you in on what his app is and, and what we did with the tier system stuff. But uh, as many of you know, uh, the tier system was developed actually in 1991 and it was spurred by the women's basketball coach at Boise state. So I'm not sure how many people know my true history, but I'm an, I was born and bred at the beginning as an Olympic strength, strength and conditioning coach. I worked with all the Olympic sports when I started in college. So a lot of people know me as a football guy and, and rightfully so, but my, my bread and butter was talked to, uh, excuse me, was, was brought up with women's basketball, women's volleyball, gymnastics, track and field, tennis, men's and women's tennis, men's golf, uh, soccer and all the like, because I was in charge of wrestling. And I was very, very fortunate at Boise State to come in contact with coaches that made uh, impeccable impact on my career, as well as my coaching style. Uh, the first and foremost would be June Doherty, our women's basketball coach at Boise State. She was a former Stanford assistant under Tara Vonderveer in the 1990s. And if you know anything about women's basketball Stanford in the 90s is what UConn is now uh Stanford was before Pat Summit in Tennessee and then what so it was Stanford Tennessee UConn and now Stanford's making a resurgence under coach Vanderveer but you know June understood what greatness looked like and when she came to Boise State she had high expectations and high impact for everybody who was associated with her program and remember back then let's remember now uh, for everybody's on the call, a little history. Strength and conditioning staffs were nothing like they are now. You had a head strength coach and a GA, and if you were lucky, you had two. Having a full-time assistant in the early 90s was almost unheard of. If you heard of a school with a full-time assistant, that was like the most amazing thing you could ever have thought of. So it was myself and Ron Thompson who ran the entire department at that time at Boise State. So uh, Ron did men's basketball and football for the majority of the time, and I had all the rest by myself. As a young strength coach, and and I believe this, you'd look. Everybody's looking for mentorships, and um, I was looking for that. I didn't know anything about Olympic lifting. Uh, my background in college strength and conditioning was my coach was an HIT coach, so I knew how to do a perfect rep. And I know how to do 20 to 100 rep leg presses, but I didn't know much about doing Olympic lifts. And when it was written in, because the coaches wanted it, believe me, we weren't doing it. If we, if we, we, uh, we were never doing it. So I had a lot to learn while I was there and got to meet a lot of different people. So I was looking for mentorship and I was looking for a way to improve myself. And I really got thrown to the wolves because Ron pretty much said, here's your sports, go for it. And I was like, oh, I wasn't really expecting that. 
And luckily that happened because I created a program that's known around the world. So it worked out for me pretty good and it worked out for the athletes. But the one thing that resonated with me was when we were meeting with June the first time and she had gone through about three or four different GAs. And when I walk in, here I am, an ex-football guy coming in about 325 pounds. Now I'm powerlifting. And all she sees is an ex-football guy thinking, here we go again. I'm just going to get the old football programs. And back then, that's pretty much what strength and conditioning was for the Olympic sports. You got the old football program. So she said something, and I don't think she meant it as a as a deterrent or a negative. She just, boy, I wish one day we wouldn't get the old football programs. And that stuck with me because she was one of my top, first sports I worked with. Uh, her and volleyball were my first two big, big sports that really – I invested a lot of time in. So from, from then on, it was just a matter of really deciphering what was going on in the weight room and what would be something that would be more conducive to training a women's basketball team and or Olympic teams. Uh, the other the other influence that I had at that time was Ed Jacoby, the track coach. And Ed wrote all his programs himself because he was a world-class track coach, one of the best jump coaches in the world in the 90s. And he didn't really trust anybody else to write his programs. So he wrote them himself and then I helped implement it, but he took me under his wing and I learned a lot from Ed later on in his career. When he came back after retirement, uh, the, the gentleman that replaced him was his assistant. And when he, and when Randy, Ed asked Randy, what should I do different this time around? He said, let Joe write the strength programs. And Ed and I sat down, I gave him my book was one I think it was the first edition of the coach's strength training playbook and he pulls me aside like three days later he goes you wrote that he goes all right we need to talk and then he let me write his programs uh the last year and a half I was there which was probably the biggest compliment I've could have gotten while I was at Boise State so long story short we're looking to develop a plan uh the three-day week plan to me was very simple to justify to myself especially with the Olympic sports I didn't feel like there was a necessity to lift four days a week with those sports that I was working with and neither in the track and field team was only lifting three days a week throwers included. So I thought there was merit there. Plus I also saw the benefits of three day whole body lifting through my time working as an athlete under a HIT approach, uh, a little bit different philosophy than I believed in because it was pretty much all machines to run through circuits but I did like the fact that we trained the whole body every time we went in the gym. That made a lot of sense to me as a young strength coach training athletics. Uh, and I thought in the end, if I could enable myself to utilize that approach, but fit in more of the complex multiple joint movements, free weight, where you're in three-dimensional movement, you've got your ground base, your feet are on the ground. How can I convert this into something that looks conducive to athletic training so it was a derivative of all the things I had learned up at that point little did I know that I was really creating a hyped up version of Bill Starr's strongest South, South, South excuse me strongest shall survives program when he had his three-day approach of a heavy moderate light system using the big three lifts of the power clean squat and bench I already at that time knew variation was the key I already figured out a lot sooner than most, how important, you know, sagittal plane, frontal plane, and later on transverse plane and single joint, excuse me, single limb movements were important in athletics. So this whole process of developing things really came into fruition into how to organize a, a plan, a weekly structure plan that gave the athlete a tremendous amount of variability, as well as a structured program that represented what we were trying to do. And that was to enhance, you know, first and foremost, all aspects of strength. And also with that being said, hopefully protect injury. Now at that point in the nineties, I think when we all would say, well, our first major girl was, uh, you know, reduce injuries. Uh, I think all strength coaches in the nineties were pretty hypocritical about that because of the way we tested and the way we evaluated and the way we allowed some garbage technique to get away on test days. In particular, when freshmen came in, you can't tell a freshman's parents on recruiting weekend that your number one goal in your program is to reduce injuries 
And the first thing you do with them, and you don't even know their names yet, is you test them in a one rep max, because you got to have that number. You got to have that number, right? We've And again, if you've done that, if you've done that in the 90s, if you worked in the 90s, you did it. You just got to be man enough to say or woman enough to say it, because that's what we were bred to do. You get them in, you test them in a one RM. Uh, did they have their physical yet? I don't know. You know what's their name? I mean, it's amazing what we did back then. And we're fortunate enough that kids were more resilient back then, thankfully, than they are now because of the activeness and uh, free play and multiple sport athletes were more conducive in those early 90s, late 80s than it is today. So uh, luckily, we didn't have too many of those issues. But we were picking exercises a lot of times based off the derivatives of the strength, the strength disciplines of weightlifting, bodybuilding, and powerlifting. And we weren't doing enough job of understanding what our athletes were capable of. In the early 90s, it was very conducive to hear through the grapevine how many kids were getting sublux shoulders in the weight room because they were snatching and they weren't prepared to snatch. And then, uh, you know, back then, man, the snatches and jerks were heavy duty test exercises in football. And I saw it in our gym as the assistant. And, and it was very, it, at that point, it was, I didn't know how to explain it then, but now I do. It's, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> and that doesn't mean there's a poor, I don't think there's any poor exercises. I think there's poor application and the way we implement them. You really need to look at who you're training and, and not so much how talented they are, but how much they're really invested if you're not training a lifter, they're not as invested as you think. Don't get it twisted. No matter how much they work hard and no matter how much they may look dedicated to the weight room, they're dedicated to their sport. And if you don't remember that, you're always going to have an issue when you try to get frustrated, when you get frustrated by picking heavy duty exercises that are that are somewhat hard. I mean, all exercises are hard to teach. But there's some that have a little bit more complexity and want to know why the athletes aren't getting it because they don't want to get it. So when you so that's why I always say the biggest thing, regardless of how you write a program, whether it's a one day a week, two day a week, three day a week, four day a week, five day a week, whatever split you're on, whatever periodization of strength model you think you're doing. The exercise pool is by far the most crucial thing that we can develop. And I and then when I first wrote the book, I didn't emphasize that, that enough. It was a big piece of the puzzle, but I didn't look at it as the most important piece. And the older I got, especially spending nine years in the NFL and really having to open your toolbox, that's when I really learned that regardless of how you're going to write a program, because we had a lot of off the script programs in the NFL. I mean, Cam Newton, Julius Peppers. Uh, during the season, uh, Luke Keekley, Thomas Davis, Greg Olson, at some point in the time, you got to vary the script. It's just the way life goes. So that may not look like a tier system program. So what are you going to do to make yourself more prepared? Is you got to have your toolbox ready with the exercises and variations. So never, never lump. I should let me repeat this. When you're designing a program, stick with what you believe in to be true, but you got to know every other model what it looks like, because you're never going to know when that curveball comes, and you're going to have to dig into deep to figure things out, especially with exercises. I don't think you can have enough variations of exercises in your pool, because you're never going to know when that one you're going to need that you never thought you would, you're going to use, because some athlete needs some really ticky-tack, single joint, uh, secondary assistance exercise that they need to do to protect themselves because they're either coming off an injury that was surgical or they're coming off an injury that you don't want to have surgery and you need to have this hard. So that's why I say the exercise pool is the most crucial thing you can do when it comes to designing a program. Coach, now, I got a question. Yeah. So what it sounds like, you know, I obviously didn't coach in the 90s because I was born in the 80s. Um, so what it sounds like in the context of 1991 is you were the first one to take training of athletes and changed it to be like, how strong can we get them and made a systemized way to how can we improve their athleticism? Does that sound about right? 
Yeah, I, I would say I would say there's some merit to that because we looked at it from, you know, at that point in time, there was still, I don't want to call it number chasing, but there was still a lot to be valued on the one RM. Like it didn't matter. It didn't matter what sport you did. Gotcha. Those coaches wanted to see improvements in strength. What I what I think we showed a little bit more was when you started to look at the way we were writing programs, they didn't look like a standard weightlifting program like football programs on a four-day split look like a standard powerlifting program except they threw a clean in on the on the back on the front end of a squat day and they threw a snatch in on the front end of a front squat day and they threw a jerk on the front uh on the uh front end of an incline day because back then it would go you know monday tuesday lower body with, with well actually it'd go monday tuesday would be front squat or squat front squat with power clean and hang clean. And then Tuesday, Friday would be bench press incline with push jerk and snatch. Mm. So all they were doing was taking a power lifting four day split and throwing four Olympic lifts across the top. And that was almost a standard in the nineties. Uh, and then you had that look, and then you had the three day HIT programs that were circuit one set to failure. So when I came out with this, when I was starting to get a little bit more tread, and remember back then it was all word of mouth, right? There was no internet at this time. Uh, like me and you always talk about it. People can say what they want. I, I'm just going to say it's fact. 1991, I was a strength coach at Boise State. <laughs> I, had a four, I had an Apple computer with the small four-inch screens that you saw on the back end of the Jerry Seinfeld shows. And we were the first one printing out Microsoft Excel templates for, for athletes. Uh, and I'll, I'll go to my deathbed on that because <laughs> most, because I know most people were still typing stuff on computers or that I mean, DOS software type, was, or on typewriters. Power I mean, 5.0, wasn't it called? Yeah, the DOS yeah that was uh, Chuck Stiggins' deal. And Coach yeah. Coach Thompson was still typing his out on uh, on a typewriter, and he would take it over to the football office, and they, she'd type it into his graphs, and then we take it over to the printer and just print cards. And I was printing stuff off of a dot matrix uh, printer that was tied to my Apple. So what our program looked like, it didn't look like a weightlifting program because it was all over the place. Like if you look at it, like I got weightlifting coaches, you know, going back for the lack of a better term, bat shit crazy because I might have a snatch or a, or an Olympic movement to third or fourth or fifth exercise in the rotation. And they're getting all, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I always used to go, well, why can't I do it? Well, you know, that's not the protocol. Protocol of what? Weightlifting. It's fine. I don't train weightlifters. And I'm not, and I know what, a, I know what a, a responses I'm trying to elicit. Every single sport you coach is about capacity. And people don't like the term power capacity, but let's face it. That's what most sports are. It's repetitive bouts of explosive efforts for a long duration of time with a lot of friggin' breaks. And you can't measure that even before tendos. You can't elicit those types of responses of strength development if all I'm going to do is allegedly fast movements at the beginning of every lift. That's like me telling a football coach, coach, you're going to have the fastest, strongest, most powerful team in the first quarter. You got to score at least 50 points because from there we're going to hang on for dear life and try to win this game. Every coach in America says what? If you don't got them bigger, faster, stronger in the fourth quarter, I'm going to fire you. Well, to me, I'm going to figure out ways to train that way so I can see how bigger, faster, and stronger they are in the fourth quarter. And the only way you can do that is to take allegedly fast, explosive type movements and move them towards the end of the, of the deal. Now, a lot of people say that's bull crap, whatever. Hey, man, check my records and check the test of time and check every friggin' school in America who's used it. <laughs> we, we, we've got a pretty good track record. So it's not but, just chasing numbers or chasing PRs or chasing max speeds on a tendo on the snatch. It's getting it's a better. Trying, yeah, it's just trying to prepare. Now, again, all that, I think, if you do it right, it's going to show up anyway. Yeah. But the ultimate goal was how to build a program that was based off of just being an athlete. And the only way you can do that is to steal exercises and movements from sports that train with those exercises and movements. But, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there that have success 
training a sport with a sport. I mean, there's been numerous people who literally trained their athletes like a, like a pure Olympic weightlifter in the nineties. And even now, like the template looks just like it came out of USA weightlifting and they've had success with that. And a lot of times is because they probably have the athletes that as long as it's structured, they're going to be in good shape. I always felt like each individual strength sport at the time, bodybuilding, powerlifting, and Olympic weightlifting all had a response that we needed. If you look at it from general terms, it's all in the book. Bodybuilding. Everybody needs lean body mass, male and female athletes. You increase lean body mass, good things are going to happen. Everybody wants to get stronger. What strong mean? I don't know, but everybody wants to get stronger. And everybody wants to be more explosive. Well, stronger you get from powerlifting exercises, allegedly, right? And explosive you allegedly got from Olympic movements. Now we know you can elicit different responses by changing the intent and the efforts of an exercise, as well as using multiple heavy jumps and throws. And all of that fits in to the exercise pool. So coach, I'm sharing on the screen what the elite template now looks like. So people can get an idea of what the tier system does and how it takes your, as you said, the powerlifting, your Olympic lifting and your bodybuilding and puts it into a three tier or five tier system and categorizes that you're training total body, lower body, upper body, and training your speed, your effort, and your volume all in the same program at the same time. Yeah. I mean, that's um, just a concurrent, it's a variation of a concurrent system. It does have, uh, we use a mixed periodization approach. I know some people, again, because of the amount of time we have to train our athletes with subsequent breaks, as well as what they're asked to do on the field. It's a concurrent sequence of different traits that come out. You got to be in shape for the long haul. You, you got to be able to be fast and you got to be able to be explosive. So a lot of that stuff comes. How do you get in shape in the weight room? You do high volume work. <laughs> uh, that generally leads to uh, hypertrophy gains. And again, really the only real difference of a traditional model, and this is a, something I didn't explain good in the book either, uh, and I think that's where a lot of people got caught up thinking that the tier system was based off training cycles when it really is just a structured rotation of exercises is the only difference between the traditional template and the elite template is instead of going heavy, moderate, light, we go dynamic effort, maximal effort and repetitive effort. And then we rotate those around based off of what the important trait is at that particular time in the training year. So the, the simplest form of what the tier system is, it's a structured rotation of exercises based off of prioritizing and order. And that's, the, and that's keeping the integrity of the template. How you cycle things is all up to the athlete or the coach, excuse me. For example, I don't know how many times people ask, can you do triphasic with the tier system? Yes, you can. Can you can you build uh, the tier system with five three one? Yes, you can. Those are training cycles. <laughs> you can do you can do the tier system with one by twenty. <laughs> you know, so so from that standpoint, I think that is something. When I do my next project, will be a lot more explanatory, and that's why I look at this next project more as a a, a real live workbook rather than a mini text where it could be really uh, the best way to look at it. So you can actually work through each level of explanation as the so-called author is explaining it to you in pen and paper. But the big, but again, the tier system. And again, I, I'm very, very humbled. Like, in, you know, Steve, you know, when you've, you, we've been around each other for a while. If you would have told me that I would be known around the world for this book, I would tell you you're a flat out liar. I, I had no, I had no real belief. I wrote that. You got to remember when that book came out and published, that was the fifth adaptation of my playbook that I gave my staff. So this book had been written five times before that book was published. That's like the fifth edition unofficial of the book. And the only reason why I wrote it is because my two assistants at the time, Mark Uyama and Cheyenne Petrie, pretty much said, House, you got to do this. Because Rich Gray in 1997 
forced me to write the article that went into the NSCA and it was very, very popular. It really, really shook a lot of things up. It really showed people you didn't really have, that there really wasn't real norms in training an athlete. And that's the best part. I mean, we've got 23 people on this call. There could be 23 different ways to train the athlete, but I'm telling you, the most important thing you're going to need when it comes to the weight room is your exercise pool. <laughs> and that and that's the key. Whether you pick a three-day and you use the tier system or you use another variation of a three-day or a four-day, the exercise pool, and I will never, I will always tell you when people say, well, what do you think the best program is? Of course, I'm going to say it's mine. I mean, I, I've proven it to myself. Other people have been proven it for me. So I know the template can be utilized in many different ways. The, the biggest criticism I have to a lot of the coaches that say they use the tier system is when they mess with the tier system. <laughs> it's not the tier system <laughs> then, anymore. Yeah, then it's not the tier system anymore. When they start, move, there's a reason. If you go back to the heavy, moderate, light example, there's a reason why it's ordered like that. It was ordered like that off of a traditional loading parameters based off of what was happening in most three day a week programs where you had one day heavy, one day moderate and one day light. And what a lot of people will tell you in those terms was the heavy day would become too heavy. Where you're trying to clean 85%, five sets of five squat, five sets of five at 85 and bench 85 at 85. That's a hard day. Even if, even back then when guys were on steroids, or, I mean, that's a hard workout. But then the light day would be five sets of five at 65. And that was before we even understood intent and dynamic effort. So people figured that's too light. So now that day's wasted. So you got two wasted days. But then the moderate day where everything was at 75% was your highest quality of overall work. So the reason why it goes like it does is because now what I want is I want all the priority exercises to be heavy. I want all the supplemental exercises to be moderate and I want all the tertiary exercises to be the light day. So now you, instead of having one day heavy, one day moderate, one day light, now you've got one day heavy for one specific movement category. And when you average it out generally, it comes out to a moderate type of load. Now you can get in a fight with an HIT guy because he'll say, well, we train uh, high intensity all the time. Yeah, that's intensity of effort. I don't care if I'm doing 1% of my max. I expect a high level of intensity of effort. I'm going to train every exercise we have with maximum concentric acceleration. So there's a difference between training intensity or the number being utilized as a percentage of a number that was tested versus the intensity of effort, which is subjective, right? How hard are you busting it through that set? That's the key to be to have success in a one set to failure program like the traditional HIT. So you could get a guy who is faking effort, right? Hmm. And gets through the one by the one set to failure. It's hard to fake effort when you got eight times two at 85%. <laughs> so people need to understand that when I talk about intensities from a heavy moderate light. I'm talking about the value of a percentage of a max. There you go, Steve. There it is. Uh, flip it. Can you go one more page? Uh, this way? Yeah, I think it's yeah, heavy moderate. Right. See that? Go down. Yeah. No, nope, other way where we had those graphs. Go to like night page 95. 95. All right. So here, see, so there's the heavy moderate. There we light. go. So again, this is just what, this was the explanation we just talked about. So here's a typical heavy, moderate light day. That's what it used to look like back in the three day a week approach. So my, my concern was, how do I get a heavy tier, a moderate tier and a light tier? Well, you can't, you can't change the order of exercises. And that's where I first had to say, okay, we can't do an Olympic lift first every time. So for me, it was, we tested clean squat and bench. Well, to me, that's the priority of our, of our program, that's first, not, not based off speed. It's based off what am I evaluating? What, what is the goal of these programs to improve? And if those are the, if those are the particular exercises, they're going to be first in the program. 
And that changes over time as I get into more of a conjugated approach and a real block system throughout a athlete's career. Then the secondary exercise, the moderate, the supplemental exercise was the moderate day and then the light. When I finally learned about dynamic effort and stuff through reading Powerlifting USA with Louis Simmons, that was the first real break, breakthrough for me because that made a lot of sense to me. And what it did was it gave more merit to what at that point in time I considered the light day. So right away, it went heavy, moderate, dynamic effort. But we kept dynamic effort to third tier because I had not figured out the concurrent sequencing model that way, if if I want dynamic effort to be the most important thing, like during preseason or in season, to stay maintaining, I can put that first. <laughs> and then, so that's, again, it's a process of learning and it's a process of continuing to be a white belt. You can never stop learning. I mean, this is the simplest, in this day and age with what's going on, uh, program design should be pretty much the simplest thing you do. If you've built out a pure organization of capabilities of what your program looks like, how you're classifying your exercises, what's your nomenclature? Is it a single leg, pure single leg, like a pistol squat, or is it a pseudo single leg, like a step up? I mean, you can get as extravagant as you can. I mean, that's, you know, talking with Mike Robertson a lot. You know, he wrote that book, The Single Leg Solution with that DVD. I mean, I talk to Mike all the time about certain nomenclatures for independent limb work. So, you know, the key is, is come up with some rules, knowing there's always an exception to the rule. Once you understand that, like here, this is the integrity of the tier system. You talk about it right here too, with, you know, check for balance and making sure you're not. Yeah, we were, we were poor. When I first wrote the tiers, we were poor because at that point in time, the, the, the journals were telling you train prime movers. Uh, so we never really trained the antagonistic muscle groups in this session. We had an auxiliary session and that was still my way to kind of fudge a four day a week training plan with the football coaches, but we were training too much pushes and not enough pulls. Now I would tell you we're doing, uh, we're definitely doing more pulls than pushes and we're really trying to balance out even more to a point where, I would tell you right now, and I think if you've heard me recently on podcast talk about it, one of the biggest changes to the tier system recommendations are any upper body tier on one, two, or three should be a trifecta of a pull, a push, and a posterior shoulder. I don't, I don't think you can get enough work of posterior shoulder work, especially the more I'm working on my neck stuff and how, uh, what's the right word, how fragile those muscles, those small muscles are in the shoulder rotator cuff and the upper back and trap, man, it's, it, it's, I don't think you can do enough work of that. I don't think yeah. you can. I think that's that, one thing the book doesn't reflect that your programs do, you know, having seen some of your programs, all your programs have a lot of supersets in them, your more recent ones, especially. And a yeah, lot I mean, we're, we're pairing. I mean, I'm, we're pairing uh, when we were in the NFL and my last few years of college, Tiers four and five were an automatic pair. I mean, all that stuff came out to be because we needed to be very, very efficient in our time. And that's where we always talked about tempo, but we really got into density. We were really tracking session times. I mean, when I was when I was at Arizona State, Daryl Eto, who was at API at the time and one of the most impressive coaches I've ever been around, I've uh, his his opinions of my programming uh, supersede a lot of people's. And when he would come through at Arizona State, man, when we were really rolling those last couple of years, he goes, "House, you got this thing on an assembly line, man. These guys are knocking out work like it's unheard of. Then he came and visited me year one at Louisville. And, he, and I go, what do you think? He goes, yeah, they're not ready yet. <laughs> he goes, they got some time. But they were used to a traditional four-day split. They were used to a little bit more – and and – the, the gentleman I replaced did a great job. They won the Orange Bowl. Uh, he worked for me at Utah. He he was, I I inherited a great group of guys at, at Louisville, but they weren't used to the density of work. But towards the end, uh, we could get 66 reps. We got 66 sets of work in from pre to post in less than 60 minutes. That's awesome. 
And that's what doing, and that's what some groups doing 10 sets of two at 80% on a squat cleaner bench. So you, you, here's what you'll learn, especially with athletes. Yeah, you have to be smart and you want to, you want to, like there's, there's stupid hard and smart hard. And I help create stupid hard in college football. So I can say that with 100% that some people are stupid <laughs> and, and I, and I was one of them. But the smart heart tells you how hard you can push somebody by looking at their, their intent in their face of how well they want to get better because you can – here's what you need to know. High-level athletes will adapt. You People will laugh when I say this, but if you really want to see the capabilities of what the human body can do, watch high-level CrossFitters and watch World's Strongest Men. I'm fortunate that I trained the four-time world's strongest man. I've seen things in the gym with him and his partners that it should, it's un, I can't believe that this, that human beings are doing this. Uh, and then last year being there live at the world's strongest man for the entire week, it's incredible what these, what the human body can accomplish. And then when you watch the CrossFitters, everything we were told you couldn't do volume wise, they do. Now, would I assign that to a college athlete? No. But what they're proving is if you train the athlete correctly and you believe in what you're doing, these athletes will respond positively. Uh, we are, we are getting too, I'm not, I'm not anti-science, I'm anti-over-science. And what's happening is we are looking so much at loads that we're forgetting why are, I mean, again, this is anecdotal evidence. Why is everybody getting hurt? Stan Van Gundy just pointed this out on a tweet. I, I just popped up this morning when I was waking up. And I believe this to be have a lot of truth to it. Is because we're managing loads so much that we're not preparing them for the loads that happen in competition. And if we're like not we're preparing... Getting humans are adaptive and they well, can respond to higher loads and adapt to it. Well, again, I'm not saying back in the day, remember, make practice the hardest thing you do there so the game's easy, but there's something to be said about that. We got to find a way to use science to be smart enough not to over push, but I think we're under pushing in a lot of ways. You can't expect an athlete to be prepared for a game if they're underprepared. Just like you can't expect an athlete to squat 700 if he's been training off of a 600 pound squat. <laughs> You know, it's just so you got to be very aware of that, just like with velocity based training. I think one of the misnomers I have with that is we're using that as a as a crutch. Hey, you're going to squat this number. And as soon as you drop under 0.42, we're cutting you off. Well, no, I need to see where the fatigue falls. So for me, if I'm going eight doubles at 85 percent and my goal is to go. Hey, I need them. I need them all under. I need my goal is all for 0.4. Because remember, I'm training for strength now. I'm not training dynamic effort. I'm training for strength. And I'm also training to prepare them for a game. So at rep five, if they go 0.39 and then rep six, they go 0.3, I'm not cutting them off. I want to see what points, what set seven and say that elicit, because I want to see the drop off in percentages. Because before there was all this technology, we always had these hypotheticals when we trained our athletes. Now this can tell me where this athlete's work capacity is. So I'm the, I want to see them strain. I want to see them fight because that's part of being an athlete. Am I looking to get them hurt? No, of course not. If their technique is crap, I'm pulling them. And I would do that without velocity-based training. But I think the capabilities is we've got to let them push and strain so that we can see where the improvements lie when we get them stronger. Like, hey, if I do 400 for eight doubles and he tails off at set four, we got work to do because that's only 80%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to train him, get him imp improve, try to improve his conditioning, come back and do that same test, and then that same workout. Now he's at six sets at point four. Well, he's gotten stronger in the way I need him to get stronger, playing repetitions in a game. So there's a lot of things that you have to look at with science. And I don't think it's going away and I don't want it to go away. Cause to me, every time I talk to somebody about what they're doing with science, it really has reaffirmed that what I was doing on gut and just 
evaluating data myself back in the day and collecting and watching we we had we were we hit more than we we didn't and and that's why we were able to have a pretty good run with all the sports that implemented the tier system i mean we had uh, ben hilgert who's the head strength coach at boise state now he won three national titles implementing the tier system with the track team at arizona state and and coach Kraft had every one of his staff members read the book so he was he was bought in uh Dwight Phillips won the long jump title with Cheyenne Petrie training him on a tier system. Uh, so it, it's the merits there. It's, it's the willingness of the coach to commit to it and believe in it and be able to find those small manipulations of exercise capabilities of their athlete. I mean, Hey, you may never get to a back squat. I'll tell you right now. I don't know if I'd ever back squat a high school athlete. Just going to tell you that flat out, maybe an offensive lineman. And if I had him for all four years, but I'm going to front squat them and I'm going to goblet squat the hell out of them. Because I think they have more fundamental uh, capabilities in athletics than necessarily a back squat does. Now, if my goal is to get them just pure, unadulterated strong, <laughs> probably going to do some back squatting. But again, that's my, that's my opinions of how I've grown. It may not be yours. I used to say the back squat was the king of exercises. I also grew up in a time where they told you don't deadlift athletes because it's too slow a movement. But yet everybody's doing power cleans from the floor with terrible technique off the floor. And I'm <laughs> like, well, why wouldn't we deadlift them to get them to be able to pull heavy weights off the floor? So I'm a, I'm a fan of deadlifting. If you, I'm a fan of deadlifts if you train the power clean. <laughs> if you're not going to train the power clean, the hex bar deadlift is to me, a very athletic-based movement because it's a little higher, so it sets your hips and your upper body in a more of a conducive athletic position, plus the neutral grip and the bar path, the whole center of gravity is linear. That's why the best, one of the most hidden exercises that's out there today is trap bar sh shrug pulls or jump shrugs because most athletes will do a shrug pull and it'll be a bump out. And they never get vertical and they never shrug. They just popped it off the thigh yeah. and the bar flies out forward and they think they're shrugging. But you, with a trap bar, you cannot do that. You will get linear and you will get vertical. So the efficiency of the movement for an athlete, remember, I'm not training Olympic lifters, but I need some of those Olympic derivatives because I believe in triple extension and whole body pulls. Our number one pull at the Panthers was a snatch grip power pull for our bigs. If a guy could catch a clean, cleanly, kind of funny way to say it, they clean. But if they didn't, we didn't clean. So that's that's my that's my deal. Trap Coach, bar high pull as well. Coach, um, I think there's two things that I I think are important. One, you're not religious to any one exercise. You're not. You have to squat, you have to deadlift. You just, you only care about what makes the athlete better. And I think that's one thing that is different. And I think that's definitely changed over time. Um, but the other thing you mentioned earlier, which I thought was funny, because I started doing this with our NFL offseason guys a few years ago, uh, is we did a three-day lift with a tier template, but we did a fourth day, just like you did with a, a one by 20 workout. So it was a very high volume, low intensity, high density day where we stacked a lot more exercises over the course of a week by using that fourth volume workout, just like you did. It's funny. We kind of both. And that's, a, and that's the good thing about a three day program. You can mm -hmm. sneak in many workouts a lot easier. So uh, Pete, Pete asked about a trap bar high pull as well. Now, are you talking about a high pull where we're actually going to break the elbows, Pete? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say whatever, whatever is comfortable to your athlete. We never did the high pull, but if if you can get them to do into that, I don't see why not. It's just going to help get them up taller, and that's why I liked the snatch grip power pull more than the 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 hang the hang position power pull is because with the snatch, they know most people know you're going overhead. So you're going to get tall with it. But a lot of times with the clean, people rush it and they try to pull themselves under. So it almost looks like you're doing some type of half pull, but an a, a amateur lifter won't get extended. 
an Olympic lifter, he'll get as high pulled to his belly button, but he's already extended and he's already going underneath. So that's why I preferred the snatch crib with a barbell. But I can be honest with you, I've never done a power pull with the trap bar, but I don't think why, why couldn't you? I mean, that's the thing is it I mean, all I would do is here's what I would say is uh, absorb, modify and imply, right? Find the idea and ask the questions, uh, implement it. And then if it works, you activate it. If you don't, you throw it out. So I would take uh, some of your more advanced athletes and see what it looks like, because it may not look right. And that's the thing is it may not, you know, depending on how those elbows flow and what that kid's doing with the bar, because that bar will oscillate a little bit. So that's the big deal that you got to figure out is what it looks like with the athletes, getting their feedback of how it feels. And here, and here's the funny thing is with the trap bar, as you've noticed, people aren't, people aren't, uh, yes, exactly. You want to have the open-ended trap bars, Lance. That's also a key have an open-ended for those um but i would say that yeah and they'll swing big time <laughs> i i would say with the trap bar what i've noticed too is your skilled athletes aren't afraid to go heavier so when we started flipping this in the panthers most of my skill guys they do trap bar shrug pulls with like you know we didn't really set any loads but we gave them like ranges they would do like 185 Two one two oh five, two twenty five, and we started going to trap bar shrug pulls. I'm looking over and looking at uh, Gooch, Jason Ben Gucci, who was our assistant, and now all of a sudden I'm seeing three fifteen, three sixty five, four oh five, and I'm like, oh yeah, we hit on this. We're not, we're not, we're not going back the other way. Same thing what we learned with a uh, safety bar front squat. But when we introduced that, we had a lot of guys doing belt squats. We had a lot of guys, a couple of guys, our older guys doing leg press. And they're like, I'll do that, coach. You'll do that? Oh, for sure. I'm winning. So that that's the big thing is just studying studying your environment, knowing your athletes. And, and again, like, like Pete asked, that's, that's part of the growth, right? Trial and error. And if you bring these, if you bring that, small group and you say look guys i think i've got an exercise that's going to be could have some real potential to help us and i want you guys to test it for me they're going to take pride in that and they're going to give you good feedback if they've been in your program long enough and have helped and you've helped develop their understanding and abilities of being of being a quality athlete and trying to teach quality and efficient movement so I went way further than Steve thought we were going to go. All right, you're good. Um, Coach, uh, I got, I got I'm going to open it up for, I want to open it up for questions so we can get that rolling. Yeah. Coach, I got a question. You ever use contrast training or as you know, they do in triphasic French contrast stuff with your main lifts. So, I mean, you know, is it contrast or complex? I mean, uh, yeah. Mike, uh, Chip Sigmund just had a pretty nice, uh, what do you call it? presentation at the NSCA this year and here's what I'll tell you with the older athletes and you could call this a version of complex I guess based off of what Chip was talking about we started replacing total body lifts with jumps and throws but when you're talking about that pure like supersetted type of contrast the only the only one that we really did and had some really good success was was tier two uh, session U, so our total body tier two day on a session U exercise where we would do our eight sets of doubles of a drop and go hang clean. And we we were a little bit shorter than what Chip recommended for rest, but within a 30 second rest, go and do a max effort vertical jump. And that was kind of our dynamic effort contrast sets for total body movements. So we had like dynamic effort bench with chains and all that, the dynamic effort squat day with chains and bands, but our dynamic effort type of uh, tier for a total body was contrasting with, uh, and what I mean by drop and go was 
So I would make it like a counter movement, like a jump. So if I'm doing a vertical jump, I'm up here, counter, go. Same thing with the hand clean. So we start up tall, high pocket, drop to the top of the knee and go. Because we would do high pocket hand clean and then dead stop clean from the knee. And then later on, we threw out the hand clean altogether and was just doing block cleans. So then the only time we did a hand clean was a pure drop and go hand clean contrasted with a vertical jump. We did mess around with some long jump dynamic effort squat stuff, but in the end, we just manipulated our tiers, our, our tier three, four, and five with our upper guys with plyometric type movements. A big one for us was long jump to a box. I had a kid go nine feet, long jump, landed on a 24 inch box, was my best at uh, Louisville. There you go, Eric, back to Louisville. So, any questions? Fire away. You guys can unmute. I guess Steve can unmute everybody or however that yeah, works. Yeah, they can unmute themselves. Okay. And if they don't, I got another question. All right. So my question is, because this is a lot of the background I came from, how did you, because you've done a lot of NFL combine training too, how did you manipulate this for your NFL combine stuff? Okay, we didn't train like this for the NFL combine. Okay, how did, okay, so what did you change for the combine to help those guys get where they go? The training for the combine was very specific to events. Mm -hmm. So we, we trained on a, we actually trained on a, a four day West Side split. Oh, smart. And we did dynamic effort. Our dynamic effort day was also our 225 day. So we used dynamic effort bench as a potentiation to train 225 bench. So on Saturdays, or was you're talking Saturday? true Louis Simmons style dynamic effort, thirty percent bands, chains, all that. Okay. I don't think we ever went over 135 pounds with a double loop mini, and we would do six triples, and then we would warm up, and then they would do their 225 training after that. And to a point where when we held, when we held our pro days at Arizona State, they warmed up with dynamic effort bench for 225. Hmm. But yeah, during for pro days, it was, uh, and what we tried to do is we tried to train uh, upper body like a bodybuilder and lower body and total body like a sprinter, because that's was the goal. The goal was to put on as much size and upper body strength as we could to improve the 225 bench. And then the lower body was to be as explosive and fast as we could to have our best jumps and our best 40s. Eric asked a question in the chat, Joe. Hold on a second. Yes. So it'd be dynamic, maximal, and repetitive. And oh, repetitive. That's the word. Well, I appreciate that. The ebooks are interesting because uh, I appreciate those who purchase ebooks, and we've all pirated ebooks. That's why, I'm not, that's why ebooks are funny, man. I'm like, just funny. Um, Here, another question I had: What do you do for your upper body lifts for, say, cross country and sports that have almost no upper body? Or I shouldn't say upper body. What did you do to your three tier orders for sports that have no upper body emphasis at all? Yeah, we just go, well, like cross country might be LTL, uh, and most of the track was TLT. Gotcha. So you would sub out that upper tier and or kick it down the line. Yeah, I mean, you still, you still it. need it, but, I mean, it was more conducive for our track athletes to have two priority clean type days and a, and a heavy squat or a squat day versus – having to bench, have a bench press day. Yeah. <laughs> well, most of, you know, most of them, uh, most of that was all dumbbell anyway. Yeah. Dumbbell shoulder press, alternate arm, alternate arm work. So, yeah. So generally it was, it, and even when I was with, um, when I, when I was with, when I was with the gymnastics team at Boise state, I'd have to check, but I almost think we went, UTU because of the amount of plyometrics and explosiveness they were doing mm -hmm. at practice every day. Mm -hmm. 
or it was L U. It was either L U L or U L U. I can't remember, to be honest. But I know we did. We we shied away from a lot of the Olympic stuff because of the amount of work and our and our gymnastics program at to this day at Boise State is extremely competitive on a national level. And those girls worked hard and they trained. They were the last group of the day. So we saw them three times a week at 530 in the afternoon and they were spent. So we had to be a little bit conscientious about that also. Cool. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, you can unmute or type it in the chat. And if not, um, I guess I could show you all what we're doing with Joe's program here. So last call for questions, folks. Dun, dun, dun. Cool. Well, oh, yeah, there you go. Joe. Oh, any other high school? Is it high school accommodation? Yeah, high school. Any other high school accommodations? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I'm not understanding what he means by a. If you were to manipulate this program for a height, like if you took over, where'd you come? Okay, I got, you, I got. You. Okay, here's what I'll tell you. Yeah. Everything on high school depends on what the scheduling system is. Mm. I was just at, I was just at, um, excuse me, Reynolds High School today, and they're on a 90 minute block. A week, A, A, B schedule. So you're going to have your guys three days a week, one time and two days a week. I'll take a nine. I'll take that schedule over ever any traditional 50 minute schedule. Any, any day of the year, knowing that I'm going to get my guys five times out of the allotted six, I could get in a perfect world. I'm doing that any day of the week. I, I would do that. With that being said, that determines how you're going to write the program. A 90 minute block, I can get five tiers in a really great pre work or my pre activity prep. 50 minute block, I'm probably got a modified pre work and three tiers. Uh, you know, when it comes to the differences between high school and college athletes, a lot of it is based off of, you know, my eighth grade entering ninth grade block zero program is how well they are uh, ready to be prepared to add resistive loads to their body. Um, you know, a college athlete is probably going to walk into, well, block zero for the six weeks, but they're probably going to walk into front squat technique. Uh, a high school athlete is probably going to walk into a body weight squat to a box technique uh, as an eighth grader, graduate into a PV, a PV pi, uh, pipe Frankenstein squat. And then we're going to goblet squat and 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 we're going to goblet squat. And when they get really good with that, I'm going to give them two kettlebells and we're going to do a two kettlebell front squat. And they're going to do that because the front, the two kettlebell front squat is a hidden beat down, especially with people like myself, even at this age that have weak cores and, and still are trying to get pure low. When you it'll take you hold those two kettlebells here and you lock down the ribs and you lock the lats in tight. Yeah, yeah, Lance knows that that's my that's my worst friggin' core exercise I can do. Matter of fact, I gotta do them next week and I'm already dreading it. So that to me, if they can master that, a two kettlebell front squat, I I and again, I've not worked with the high schools to, to actually put these progressions where I've seen it with my own eyes. But if they could kill the goblet squat, move to the two kettlebell squat, and as you're continuing to do that, keeping working the wrist and shoulder flexibility so when it's time for them to get under the front squat properly, I would think they would wreck a front squat the first time they did it. And that's the key with the youth athletes are, when you get them in early, Regardless of what you're training them now, prepare them for the movements that you want them to accomplish later. So if you want them to catch a clean or you want them to rack a front squat, you've got to build in that shoulder mobility and that wrist flexibility into your mobility program the very first day they come in. So a lot of it is really looking at, people call it reverse engineering or regressions. I just call it bit layering. How are you going to layer this process? The, the college is a little bit older and, and stuff with that. So that's that's the thing that you'll see. And, and it's funny you say that 
uh, Lance, because what I've learned too is how uh, a lot of these layers as you get older become your main focus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I, and I'm in a whole different training process now, but it's funny that I, I even noticed that with the NFL guys, like we're doing stuff that, yeah, this is supposed to be in the teaching progression, but, and that's the great thing about building teaching progressions because you come up with so many great exercises you always, there's always a block zero concept in, in a program. Like you're always going to do Nordic curls. Like I'm a big fan of that. That's a block zero body weight movement. You're always going to try to work in some type of pull up or inverted pull up. You're always going to, you know, a lot of people still believe in dips. So, and, you know, and then remember when you're out on the field, a lot of your movement prep is body weight, lower body work. I'm going to do a lateral lunge. I'm going to do a crossover lunge. I'm going to do a forward lunge. I'm going to do a reverse lunge in my dynamic warm-up, So that all helps the high school athlete. And, and don't ever think a high school athlete who's never lifted weights goes out and you teach them how to do some walking lunges. That's strength training. Don't ever forget it. Just remember too, when those kids are sprinting on the football field, that's strength training. When I watch Ted Ginn run six to eight, nine routes of practice and then have to return punts, that's sprinting, that's strength training. And you got to remember that when guys come in the weight room, you got to be very, very aware of that. Um, you know, people talk about lifting during on game day, high school athletes, man, if they're lifting at seven in the morning, I don't think it's going to bother them. I, I, I haven't done enough experience with that. Uh, I don't know how many NFL guys would buy into that as my career ended. Uh, college guys, I don't know either because, you know, generally college football, that their, their, their schedule is ridiculous to game day. Uh, their coaches are meeting this, walk through this, take, and I'm big in taking naps. I'm big in the recovery part. Cause I, if I did my goal and worked them out the way I'm supposed to, they're ready. Like we'll, we'll throw some med balls and stuff. I do believe in like the potentiation stuff is uh pregame. I would do some, I would do some med ball throws. Our, our D line with the Panthers, we had a nice little pregame warm up about an hour before they had to come out with their D line coach and me. I did the general work and they did the specific. It was a pretty good deal. You know, and again, that's the thing when, when, when Lance talked about activate the CNS, you know, if, if you play at four o'clock in the afternoon and you're doing your potentiation workout at seven in the morning, I don't, I don't think that activation's over. So when, that's why I say, if you're going to build it, do it, do let's, let's build it into, Hey man, pregame, we're going to, we might go out there a little bit earlier and, and work some groups out and do some, some jumps and throws. And that's what we did. We did some jumps and throws. We did some basic power skipping and, stuff like that. And we threw some med balls and we, and we were off, off to the races. All right, man, why don't you show them what we got, Steve? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if you guys, so what we did today, um, Joe's going to be running six more of these over the next, I don't know, what is it? Six months, um, one per month. So let me kind of show but, but now don't don't give them false advertising let them know how you get that yeah yeah so um one cool thing is though is <laughs> just you, because i don't want to be that guy to go hey you said he yeah had you're right of these. yeah me and joe have been working on this for about two years now getting a tiered system of strength coach pro ready so uh strength coach pro is our program design tool you know just helps you make our uh make programs for your athletes you know very simple program um, Joe, I didn't even get to show you this, but we got a new percent range and a rep range option built in, which we're pretty happy with. Um, but it's, it's this cool way to help your athletes make programs. And we've got this new tier system stuff built into it with the programs and the exercises and sets and reps and all of that. Um, and the other part is you get to work with Joe once a month for the next six months and get NSCA CEUs for it as well. So we're pretty happy with it. Um, happy that it came out and launched and we've got quite a few people in it. So yeah, if you're looking to uh and here's a couple of things that I would say for Steve too. So you get an idea. What 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 our what our part is the tier system is we just downloaded a library. So there's some preloaded four-week programs, eight-week programs, but the real key to me is it, it gives you an entire exercise pool library mm -hmm. and it and it gives you my training cycle library. Yep which I think is worth the, the cost of admission. But the great part, what I love about it is you as the coach can add in anything you want. You can build your own templates. If you don't want to use a tier system, if you're not a tier system coach, 
And you, what you have is you have the availability to study the programming to make up your own. Like I, I don't actually tell you, hey, just take this eight week football program and use it with your kids. I want you to actually use it as an educational standpoint where you can see what it looks like and then you can make your manipulation based off of your athletes. The key to me, what this project was, was getting the, the cycles and the exercise pool uploaded so that the coach could have more um, time on their hands to not have to worry necessarily about loading them in themselves. Yeah. It's a more of a plug and play more so than actually utilizing the, I want you to build your own tier programs. What we gave you is we gave you some ideas to look at Yep. and everything else is drop, drop and drab. And, and remember Steve was, uh, Steve did a, Steve's the smartest person from the Excel group because he he was the one who figured out how to monetize everybody else's Excel templates. <laughs> so kudos to him. And because <laughs> of that, he, he learned what Man. people liked about Excel and developed an app where, from what I understand in my limited knowledge of the other apps. Oh, Excel training uh, designs? Yeah, a lot yeah, of the... They a lot of the training, templates. yeah. A lot of the a lot of the other apps that are out there now are, are are good apps. But what Steve's done is made this with the types of capabilities that people who are Excel people have some of that capabilities within an app. Is that correct? Me saying it like that? Because yeah, know we took all of the features of Excel, the things that coaches liked about Excel, the ease of use, versatility, and affordability and built it in, and we were just like you used before, right? Reverse engineered. We reverse engineered digital software that has those features. Fast, easy, and affordable, not difficult, annoying, and expensive. And, and, then, and then what we've done is we have the tier system package if you're a new user, and then for, for users of Steve's program already, you have an app, you can add on the library. Yep. to your existing package. And, and again, what I've learned about some of these apps and even those people who are pushing force plates and, and data, it's all reoccurring fees. I mean, that's where they get you is reoccurring fees. Hey, yeah, it costs 30000 a year <laughs> to store stuff on, on, on your server. Steve, and I believe a lot of it is because he's a former coach, it's a one-time fee mm -hmm. for a lifetime. And that, to me... That says something about Steve as far as everybody needs to make money. I'm not going to sit here and lie to anybody. But the fact that he's willing to do non-reoccurring fees tells me that he was an ex-coach and he understands, regardless of where the money's coming from, that he's coach conscious. And that's what I appreciated about it. One of the reasons why I decided to team up with him was, was the non-reoccurring fee package. No, we're happy with it. But yeah, my, my, the thing I think most important is the fact that you get to work with Joe once a month for the next six months. I'm sure y'all learned something on this call and you get CEUs for it. Um, that's all I got though, Joe, if you got any uh, final statements or things people should know or how they can reach you. I mean, I, I'm on Instagram a lot as most people probably could figure out, probably addicted to it from what my wife says, but yeah, I, I, I try to be as open as I can. I, I like sharing. I like giving back to the field. The field's done way too much for me not to do certain things like this. Uh, and if so if you reach out to me, I'm very, I'm not, no one's 100%, but I'm generally pretty quick to answer training questions and any type of advice people have. I've even had people hit me up on DMs and we've set up one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls and I don't mind doing that in the front end because you just never know. Uh, as long as people are paying it forward, I'm, I'm good with his helping as many people as I can. Cool. Awesome. I appreciate it, coach. All right. Well, good luck to all of you. And I appreciate you all jumping on and listening to me ramble on. I'm pretty good at rambling. <laughs> um, and again, thank you very much. And we appreciate all of you. And if you get, if you need anything from me, just reach out. I'll do my best to give you a, the most logical answer I can. Cool. Awesome. Talk we'll to you guys later. Thank you very much.